Welcome to episode five of the Food History Happy Hour. It's kind of hard to believe we've been doing this for five weeks, but here we are. Uh, I'm Sarah Bosberg, the food historian, and I'm guessing things are looking a little nicer this episode because I have a brand new webcam. Hi, Neil. Thanks for joining. Um, purchased by my lovely husband. It was a present from him, so... You can thank Chad for this like widescreen profile right now and the fact that everything is not horribly pixelated. So thanks to Chad. How's everybody doing today? It's cold where I am still, which is fine by me. I don't mind the cold, but I know a lot of people are very anxious about, about it. It's a little bit colder here in the Hudson Valley of New York than it normally is this time of year. Um, so for that reason, <laughs> Chad is a good guy, Neil. It's very true. He is. Um, for that reason, I thought we would spend a little time with the American Southwest today. So that's what my talk cocktail is going to be. Wow. They're like, can I actually see how, who's watching right now? Is he going to tell me? No. I hate that. So if you're watching, you should tell me that you're watching. So I can say hello. Um, so the name of the cocktail for tonight is called the Desert Healer. Don't ask me where I got that name. I tried to look up some history about it. Couldn't find much. Hi, Becca. Um, it is still going around the internet. Hi, Carla. Uh, as a cocktail that people make. Found it on a bunch of cocktail websites, but nobody had any real history. Hey, Marty. Um, it's an interesting little cocktail. No cocktail shaker tonight. Hi, Erin. Um, and we are going to use cherry brandy again. I'm bound and determined to use this stuff up before the summer so I can make another batch in July. Hopefully, I'll be able to get to my mother-in-law's sour cherry tree. We'll see how that goes. So this time I'm not using a jigger. I'm using this cute little measuring shot glass. I don't know if you guys can see. It says mini measure on it. And it has the ounces. You probably can't see that right on there. So this cocktail calls for, I am using Cherry Bounce, Neil. My homemade Cherry Bounce. No spices in mine though. So I think it's a little more similar to Cherry Brandy. Hi, Don. I'm sorry the internet is slow where you are. Hopefully it'll catch up. So for those of you who are just joining us, we're making the Desert Healer cocktail, um, which I got from a cocktail recipe book from 1946, which is very appropriate for our discussion today. So it calls for two ice cubes in a 10 ounce glass. It calls for We'll do the booze first. No, we're not. We're going to do the orange juice first because then the booze will mix in. It calls for three ounces of orange juice and gin. Yes, it has gin in it too, Neil. You know? <laughs> I think I might be able to make the, uh, the case that sour cherries are essential. <laughs> Aaron. <laughs> All right, so it calls for three ounces of orange juice. So I'm sure... You know, I could have used real oranges. I actually have blood oranges, which would probably be very, very good in this, but I'm just going to use regular bottled orange juice for now. So there's one ounce. Whoops. Crap, that's more than one ounce. That's okay. Two ounces. I'll make the third one a little scant. We'll do three quarters of an ounce. All right, there's my three ounces of orange juice. Um, hi, Becca. <laughs> oh, no, I can't get it open. Okay. Whew. Yes, Ashley, it's called the Desert Healer. Don't ask me why. Maybe because it looks sort of sunsetty. All right, so, of course, because I have the cherry bounce in a jar that doesn't pour very well, I'm going to make a mess, so I'm going to use this cute little ladle. And it only calls for a third of an ounce, which of course is not marked on here. 
but that's okay. We'll just guesstimate a little bit. All right, that's slightly less than half an ounce. So I'll pop that in there. And then it calls for an ounce of gin. As per usual, I'm using Blue Coat American Gin, which we love in our house. Close up my cherry band so that doesn't need to be open anymore. Okay, so an ounce of gin. There we go. And then, most interestingly, you fill it with ginger ale. Um, I have seen some recipes call for ginger beer. Not a huge fan of ginger beer. It's a little too gingery for me. Um, and this one's had ginger ale. So we're going to fill it with ginger ale. Okay. There we go. The Desert Healer. It'll be interesting to see how this uh, combination of cherry brandy and um, gin goes. So, that's what it looks like. Oh. Oh, I like that. It's very interesting. Yeah, I can see myself drinking a lot of those. It doesn't taste really of any of its ingredients. <laughs> it tastes a little bit like like orange juice, just a little. Um, the, the ginger ale just adds kind of a sweet fizziness. Um, The cherry brandy adds this interesting fruitiness. And then, of course, you have a little bit of juniper -y herbalness from the gin. Yeah, and I'm getting, like, just these little hints of cherry at the end. Dang, you guys, this one's a winner. I did not think I was going to like this that much, but this is really good. Ooh, Neil just shared cherry lime Ricky. That sounds good. No, Anna Catherine, not Minnesota interesting. <laughs> For those of you not from the Midwest, when somebody from the Midwest says something is interesting, that usually is not a good thing. Um, but in this case, I mean interesting in, in the terms of not what I expected, slightly unpredictable, fascinating. It's more of a fascinating drink. Yeah. Yum. Yeah, I mean, all the drinks I've made so far have been pretty good. Even the flip from last week, that was drinkable. Um, but I would definitely make this one again. Yeah, the cherry and the gin. What? I would not have mixed those things together, and it's really good. Okay, I'm going to stop raving about um, this delicious drink right now. Uh, and talk a little bit about the American Southwest because that was kind of my inspiration for tonight because it's cold and rainy and it's been cold and rainy here in New York for the past couple of days. It's okay that you missed last week, Neil. You can always just look it up on my blog. Um, although it was a fairly 18th century drink, so <laughs> now you have to watch it. Um, because it's been raining and because we talked a little bit about Mexican food last week, I thought we could talk a little bit more about it this week. Um, I have had in my digital cookbook collection for a long time um, a cookbook called California Mexican, the California Mexican, the California Mexican Spanish Cookbook, which was published in 1914 by Bertha Hafner Ginger is her name. Um, she was an American home economist who moved to California, uh, and became totally enamored of 
Mexican cuisine. So she wrote a cookbook about it um, because she had done so many demonstrations in our little, you know, cooking demonstrations that home economists usually do. Uh, and the Mexican food ones were always the most popular. So she wrote a Mexican cookbook in 1914 that became kind of a sensation and really introduced a lot of Americans to Mexican cuisine outside of um, Southern California. So yeah, it's a pretty interesting little book. I would probably cook most of the things. And actually, it just occurred to me, I can share the link to this book in the comments right now. So you guys can follow along if you want. And then of course, I'll also post the link on the blog. What? Look at that. I'm learning. Um, so it's a delightful little book. There's lots of uh, bean recipes, calls for lots of um, green bell peppers, which is why watered down American versions of Mexican food usually contain green bell pepper, I think, <laughs> and onion and tomato. Um, but there's lots of pink beans, which I love are delicious. There's some really interesting salad dressing recipes in there, um, one of which calls for making your own flavored vinegar with garlic, cucumber, tarragon, parsley, I think onion, which sounds good to me. I would probably make that. Um, so she's really the first person to start popularizing Mexican food outside of Los Angeles, Southern California, and also um, the Mexican border, places like uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas already have their own versions of Mexican cuisine. One interesting thing that she talks about, and you see this in a lot of other cookbooks, um, is she talks about the difference between Mexican and Spanish food. So because Mexican people um, largely speak Spanish, and would speak Spanish in the United States. Um, she, a lot of people attributed Mexican recipes to Spanish recipes, but she talks about how if you went to Spain, most of the recipes that were considered Spanish um, in the United States w are not recognizable by people who actually live in Spain. So she clarified that they're actually Mexican Indian or indigenous Mexican cuisine, um, which is one of my favorites, it's delicious. Uh, so yeah, Mexican food becomes increasingly popular in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, particularly in the late 30s and early 40s. Uh, the American Southwest, spurred by Hollywood, um, becomes a really fashionable uh, vacation destination. Um, I don't know if she talks about the different regions of Mexico, Carla. I think she's largely talking about Mexican food as it exists in the United States her experiences in California. Um, and there's some, definitely the cookbook version that I sent, which is a facsimile of the original with all of the images and stuff. There's some, you know, paternalistic white supremacist, borderline racist stuff in there, just to warn you. Um, you know, she talks about the old padres at the Spanish missions, making life better for the poor Indians sort of stuff, which is not the greatest. Um, so I think she's largely conflating everything together. Although apparently her cookbook is the first cookbook reference in the United States to tacos, which is pretty cool. Um, she also mentions enchiladas, all sorts of chili sauces, which is great. Um, chili con carne, which is what most people call like chili, like the stew chili today. Um, tamales are in there, all that good stuff. And then there are also some recipes that are actually Spanish from Spain, um, mostly with eggs <laughs> and, and steak and all kinds of fun stuff. She does differentiate between Mexican and Spanish in her recipe titles, um, which is interesting. But Carla, she, I don't think she talks about the various regions um, I also did a little bit of research about burritos, which are another of my favorites. Um, so burrito means a small burrow, and that apparently comes from uh, the Sonoran 
region where they made both corn tortillas and wheat tortillas. And apparently um, one of the things they would do is they would make these giant 20 inch wheat tortillas, uh, flour tortillas, and fill them with stuff and roll them up. And that was a burro. So a full size donkey. <laughs> and then the smaller versions, the personal size versions were called burritos or little donkeys. Um, so I thought that was fascinating. And I'm sure many of you know, um, some of my friends know that nachos are like one of my favorite foods. Um, and nachos, of course, are not Mexican at all. They were invented um, by a Mex Mexican restaurateur for some American women because he didn't have anything else in, in the restaurant and they came in late at night and wanted food. So he chopped up some tortillas, fried them, and then put a little bit of cheese and a pickled jalapeno on each one. And that's how we get nachos. So that's my little foray into Mexican food. I'm gonna drink more of this delicious drink. Does anybody have any questions or comments for me? Yeah, this is totally addictive. I think Neil asked earlier, is this gonna be drunk history? <laughs> Food history happy hour? It is not, it is not. I'm only going to have one um, and I'm not going to pound it. So we should be okay. Ah, yes, Neil says almondigas and stewed beans, her soup recipe. Yes, almondigas, I believe are small Mexican meatballs, right? Let me search for it. Which I have never actually had. Um, although I love beans of all kinds. Hmm. I'm up print search parameters. Womp womp. But anyway, I thought this would be a fun resource for people if they want to do any cooking. And of course, all the rice recipes are Spanish rice because rice is not indigenous to North America. There's only a couple of dessert recipes, which is interesting, probably just as well. Okay, what am I missing while well, I'm not looking at this? What are you guys talking about? It was Marty? Oh, Marty asked if it was drunk history. Sorry, Neil. Sorry, Neil. <laughs> um, I am not going to do a drunk history. Sorry. I mean, maybe if the show asked me, maybe, but probably not. I've been asked to be on a couple of shows that I've actually turned down because I didn't want to be associated with them. So I do have standards. Not that I don't really enjoy drunk history because I do. Um, I just don't really enjoy being drunk. <laughs> so I don't think it would turn out that hot. That's all. Well, what's everybody else up to? I, I am still going to plan to do a bar tour, just not tonight. I've had kind of a long week and I haven't been sleeping that great. So I actually took a nap so that I would be awake for this tonight. You're welcome. Neil says Townsend's. What about them? You mean the, like, Jazz Townsend's people? Explain yourself, Neil. All right. <laughs> you guys are not giving me any good questions this time. What else do you want to talk about? Um, video request. Ooh, Anna K. 
Catherine is enjoying. Oh, Neil says to stay away. It was not them. It was actually, um, well, I'll be, I'll be, um, honest, although I probably shouldn't. I did get a request from the History Channel that I turned down. Um, and then I got a request from the Dr. Oz show, which I turned down for a variety of reasons. Um, so it's not just Townsend. I don't think they do a bad job. You might be more, uh, more of a stickler than I am, Neil. <laughs> All right, Anna Catherine says she's enjoying a Sage Brown Derby. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is, so you will have to tell us. Um, I assume it's some sort of beverage with sage in it. So, what else can we talk about? Um, Anna Catherine did put in a request for celery sauce. Heinz celery sauce. What is the secret recipe of Heinz celery sauce? I haven't gotten there yet, um, but I'm working on it. There's a couple of different variations. Um, I did get a little bit of insight from uh, the Victory Kitchen podcast on Instagram because I posted about it today. Uh, she has a Heinz cookbook from the 1940s that has a recipe for celery sauce. That's cream of celery soup that you add white sauce to. <laughs> um so it could very well be that the bottled Heinz celery sauce was a cream slash white sauce based sauce, although that would be somewhat difficult to bottle. Um, but you never know. You never know. So I'm gonna keep looking. We'll see. I have way more 19th century cookbooks than I thought. Um, I've gotten a lot of delightful cookbook donations in the past couple of years, in the past couple of months, I should say. Um, so I've had fun perusing those. Probably should have brought the one down here, but because it's got some really great illustrations in it. But I will leave that for a blog post. Um, Heather says she wants a Spanish chocolate cake. I have been craving cake so much lately, you guys. It's really awful. I just want cake all the time, which is bad. Um, I can't stand most grocery store cakes. Um, and there's no decent bakeries anywhere nearby me, which is probably a good thing because then it forces me to make my own dessert if I really want dessert and I'm lazy. So I don't <laughs> make it that often. <laughs> I have been thinking about cookies though. Um, so I might make some cookies this weekend. Ooh, Anna Catherine says two ounces of rye, one ounce grapefruit juice, half ounce lime juice, half ounce simple syrup, two dashes of bitter, shake on ice, garnish with a massaged sage leaf that sounds amazing amazing i like anything with grapefruit juice in it though and bitters you can't say no to either of those things yes anna catherine i am also very confused about the celery sauce i don't know how they could bottle a cream based sauce um but they did end up making cream of whatever soups not that long after so Surely they had pressure canning, although not, I don't think, in the 1870s. Maybe they did. I have to look it up. Um, you know, who said that about Adams? <laughs> um, Heather says Adams makes a really good kick if you call it in. I am not impressed with the Newburgh Adams Bakery. They make really good bread. Uh, I have not been very impressed with their cakes. Maybe because I don't order. I order from the the case instead. But, yeah, they're kind of cheap tasting. Shh. I love Adams, but not impressed. Mmm, Neil shared Spanish pickle recipe. That sounds yummy. Maybe we should just call Heinz Anna Catherine. Maybe, or we could email the Heinz History Center and be like, tell us about celery sauce. But I'm also having a lot of fun really looking up in all my cookbooks, the celery sauce recipes. Um, for those of you who don't know, because most of us don't, um, celery sauce is basically a lot of celery. Most recipes call for anywhere between three to six heads of celery chopped up and boiled. Um, and then you usually add some combination of white sauce, which is flour and butter and milk. Um, some call for turkey stock. 
some call for eggs, uh, and it's meant to be served with roast fowl. So chicken, turkey, quail, um, those sorts of things. So I'm not going to try making it. It sounds like really screwed up gravy. I enjoy celery. I don't enjoy cooked celery that much. I mean, it's good in soup. Maybe it's, I've never had cooked celery. Maybe it's delicious. I don't know. Um, but I'm just going to keep looking. Okay. Comment storm. Neil has been graciously sharing some of the recipes from Bertha's uh, Mexican Spanish cookbook. So I'm just taking a look here. Oh, Neil says celery sauce is also popular in the 18th century. Maybe that's why it's largely disappears by the 19th century. Or, sorry, by the 20th century. Aaron says invent a celery sauce cocktail. Somehow I don't think a flour-based white sauce would go very well with a cocktail. That might be kind of gross. Although celery and something with gin would probably be pretty delicious. Yep. Yep. So anyway, that's what I'm up to. I've also been working on my book, actually knuckling down and working on the book. You guys, it's hard. It's hard during pandemics to get the kind of focus that you need to work on the book edits, I tell you. But somebody uh, reminded me that people who don't know anything about World War I, I should probably give an introduction <laughs> to World War I to them. So that's next on my list is to revamp my introduction so that it's actually helpful to people who aren't food historians or World War I historians. Ooh, Neil makes celery vinegar. Could probably make, so actually, you know, we could do, we could infuse some gin with celery. I love infusing alcohol. Hello. Can we tell? I also have some hedro gin um, in the basement, which is gin with uh, all kinds of fruit in it. Mine had an apple, a pear, blackberries, and plums. Heather says, how much more original writing do you need to do? I have about half of a chapter a new chapter on propaganda that was requested by my editor. So I'm about halfway done with that. Um, I just added a section about, well, I started adding a section about film. I have to finish it um, based on a secondary source that I got called Real Patriotism, which mentions quite a lot about the food administration and the films that they made. And I'm like, come on, National Archives, hurry up and digitize those films. <laughs> They're all on real to real film. They all apparently still exist um, in the National Archives, including one on food preservation, which I'm like, ah, why can't I watch it? Um, another fun fact is that silent movie star Clara Bow was in a bunch of World War I um, propaganda films, including the food preservation one, which now I'm like, why is this? not a priority to digitize. That sounds like it would be amazing to watch. Um, so I might badger the National Archives about it. <laughs> um, yeah, celery infused gin would make an interesting martini, Marty. I'm not a huge, I like sweet drinks. I won't lie. I have a sweet tooth. I'm not a huge fan of the more savory beverages, but it would be interesting. Um, Neil said, steep lots of celery seeds in vinegar and use for salads. That sounds delicious. I should probably also start infusing vinegar, too, because that's another really easy way to add delicious flavors to things. Um, oh, speaking of vinegar, so the 1897 cookbook that I posted the recipe for celery sauce on Instagram today is a really fascinating cookbook. It's called Breakfast, Lunch, and Dinner. Um, again, published in 1897. And... It has a whole section on salads, of which, unlike most 
late 19th century cookbooks. I would actually eat most of the salads that are listed in there. They all sound pretty fantastic. Um, and there's the whole section on savory fruit salads. What? I'll see if I can post it on Instagram or the blog later uh, this weekend. But yeah, they all sound lovely. I mean, some of them are fairly straightforward and I've actually made on my own before, including one um, that's just oranges and onions in a vinaigrette. That one is very good. Um, you can also add green olives if you're feeling adventurous. And I have some blood oranges, so maybe I will make an orange and onion salad this weekend. We'll see. Um, let's see, what else am I working on? Not a whole lot. Besides the book, trying to finish the book, you guys, so I can do other really cool stuff. Oh, I do have another Cooking by the Book talk scheduled with New City Library um, coming up on Thursday, May 7th. Uh, that's another free virtual talk if anybody's interested in that one. And eventually, um, I am probably going to offer my own hosted talks on a variety of subjects. So keep your eyes peeled for that. But I'm Trying to book first. <laughs> Carla asks, what is tripe? That is a great question. Tripe is the stomach lining of a calf. Pretty sure. Let's just double check. Um, yes, the first or second stomach of a cow or other ruminant. Um, I have never had tripe, uh, unless some people... I don't have a huge interest in offal, which of course is like organ meat from animals. Um, but tripe is actually quite common in Spanish and Mexican cuisine, coming back to our theme. Um, yes, Erin Chad says it's delicious. I think for me, it probably would not be a flavor so much as a textural issue. Um, if you see tripe, it has like, it's like a white, um, substance that's like honeycomb patterned almost it's a very interesting texture um so i'm not sure that i would like it that much <laughs> neil says it's an awful sort of awful it's a very cute play on words uh okay somebody else said something and i missed it what do they say oh becca says tripe is yummy i mean i've seen one of my favorite local Mexican restaurants has tripe tacos, which I would maybe try. And they do um, the really authentic, authentic, we can talk about that as well, authentic Mexican taco where it's um, the meat in a corn tortilla with chopped white onion and lime. That's it. No cheese, no sour cream, no lettuce, none of that stuff, just onion and lime. Um, I should probably try it just to say that I've had it. Um, what else did I miss? Ooh, yes, Anna Catherine says the Lee brothers have a lovely, lovely savory citrus basil avocado salad. So the other interesting thing, let's talk about avocados for a minute, speaking of Mexican cuisine. Um, did you know that the other name for avocado is alligator pear? So if you ever see a recipe that uses alligator pears, those are avocados. Of course, it makes sense because Haas avocados in particular um, have kind of knobbly dark green, dark green skin. So it does kind of look like alligator skin and they are pear shaped. Um, so that makes sense. But yes, I love avocados as any good millennial does. Um, but you do find historic recipes for them. Um, I think there might be one in the 1897 cookbook. I'll have to look that up. But largely the recipes are like, Cut an avocado in half, <laughs> pit it, sprinkle it with salt and or sugar. I saw a recipe that said sprinkle with sugar. That was weird. Um, and then pour like a vinaigrette dressing on top. So it's like deconstructed guacamole. I would eat that. <laughs> uh, what else we got here? Um, oh, I'll get back to you in a minute. Oh, Amanda, I did see yours. Um, Carla says on page 96, what is an asbestos mat? Yes, asbestos mats. So asbestos, if you've ever seen those uh, lawyer advertisements for mesothelioma, 
um, was a really common fire retardant material or fire resistant material um, that it was discovered, I believe, in the mid 19th century. And it was used a lot um, to insulate areas where you have a lot of heat. Um, it was used a lot in linoleum, tile. So if you have old school tile in your house, there might be asbestos in it. Um, and it's a really horrible um, lung irritant that causes cancer and mesothelioma and all kinds of other diseases. But it is a great non-conductor of heat. So um, I don't know what reference it's using it to. I should probably look on page 96. Give me one second here. But basically, you can hold it over an open flame and take it off and put your hand on it there. It does not transfer heat at all. Okay, so this, the California Mexican Spanish cookbook of 1914 talks about when you cook rice, boil it hard for 10 minutes, um, then boil slowly until all the water is absorbed, put an asbestos in that under the vessel and do not stir. So I think that's probably just to help um, absorb some of the heat. Um, but yes, we don't use those anymore because if you inhale the particles, it's really bad. Um, uh, okay. Amanda says, what would you do with okra besides pickle it? Yes. So okra, um, is from Africa, came to the United States, um, apocryphally in the hair of people who had been captured and enslaved. Um, a lot of people don't like okra. They think it's slimy. I like okra. I haven't had okra in a long time, um, largely because it's hard to find in grocery stores and stuff. Um, but I like it. My favorite way to eat okra, let's be honest, is um, basically breaded with egg and cornmeal and deep fried, and then you dip it in remoulade sauce. That's my favorite way to eat okra. Um, but it's also good in any kind of soup. I try not to cook it too long because I actually don't like um, the main property for which it's prized is just that it thickens um, soups, but I it gets a little slimy for me. Again, that textural issue. Um, so I like it just kind of lightly cooked or stir fried. Um, great with tomatoes, anything with tomatoes, okra is very good with. Um, but again, breaded and fried with remoulade sauce. It's definitely my favorite way to eat okra. Yes, avocado and vinaigrette dressing is awesome. Aha, Anna Catherine found a reference to alligator pear in a 1930s mystery novel, right? And it says that there's lots of asbestos heating mantles hanging around in old chemistry labs. Yeah, if um, it's often you'll find it wrapped around hot water pipes. Uh, it was used to insulate stove pipes in buildings. People would put it under um, cast iron wood stoves and coal stoves. Um, so, and it's fine for the most part, so long as it's not being shredded and aerosolized. So the real danger um, is when it's exposed, right? And it's, the particles are getting in the air. That's when it's really dangerous. Um, so, but if it's not being exposed, it's fairly safe, right? So just be very careful when you're working in old buildings. Um, definitely check to see, have a professional check for asbestos before you do any home renovation if your house is older than 1970. <laughs> um, and uh, definitely if there's asbestos, you're gonna have to pay a lot of money for asbestos remediation. It's dangerous stuff. Mm, Anna Catherine says, yes, fry all the okra. Oh, it's so good when it's fried. Um, if you like fried green beans, which is another extreme favorite of mine, you will love fried okra. So good. Uh, but Anna Catherine says it's also really good with hominy, which I have never had okra and hominy. For those of you who don't know, um, hominy is a corn product. Very interesting history. We can talk a little bit about corn since we're also talking about Mexican and indigenous American foods, right? Um, so hominy is what happens when you take uh, dried field corn 
and you soak it in lye, right? And then, which takes the hull off and then you rinse it a bunch of times. That's like the puffed up chewy insides of field corn and you cook it. It's almost like a grain. If you've ever had um, pozole with giant uh, white corn in it, that's a type of hominy. Um, and the interesting thing about corn, which I think I've talked about this before, maybe in the first episode, but the interesting thing about corn is that corn has niacin in it, which is an essential nutrient for people to live. You have to have niacin to live. Niacin is present in a lot of meat. Um, but in corn, you cannot get the niacin from corn unless you do a process called nixtamalization. Of course, you see the word tamal is in there, right? Like tamale. Um, and that is you soak it in lye, which is uh, comes from wood ashes. Historically, you soak wood ashes in water for a long time, and it creates a caustic solution called lye. And by treating the corn, dried field corn, with the lye, the process called nixtamalization, you basically make the niacin available in corn able to be absorbed by the body. So this is an indigenous invention and it's how indigenous people could survive on very corn heavy diets without um, having niacin deficiency, uh, which is not fun. People in the American South in the 19th century didn't always know about this. They didn't nixtamalize their corn um, and niacin deficiency, which is also called spring sickness, because of course, over the winter is when you're eating less fresh foods, in particular fresh meat, you're eating cured um, or dried meat or no meat at all. Uh, and that's when you get your niacin deficiency. So interesting little fun fact. Neil chimes in, yes, grits are made from how many? Um, are, are you saying that I pronounced nixtamalization correctly, Anna Catherine? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty much spelled like it's pronounced. It's not too hard. Um, but corn tortillas, if you've ever, if you've ever heard of masa harina, that's corn meal that's been nixtamalized. And people in, um, Mexico often will do their own fresh nixtamalization every time they make corn tortillas, which sounds fantastic to me. Um, although I think nowadays people might use lime instead of lye, but uh, yeah, fresh corn tortillas. I gotta learn how to make those, you guys, but um, kind of hard to grind your own corn these days if you don't have the proper equipment, which a lot of people in Mexico do, which is amazing because fresh corn tortillas are fantastic. Um, but yes, yeah, so that's a little history lesson about nixtamalization and hominy. Um, Anna Catherine says grits is the highest form of corn. I don't mind grits. Grits are pretty good. I don't know that they're the highest form though, but I'm not a southerner, so what do I know? Um, personally, I think it's a toss up between fried corn tortillas and uh, popcorn. But that just tells you that I like my corn crunchy, so. Oh. <laughs> Anna Catherine says she never says nixtamalization correctly. That's why. Oh, Ashley B. Gina asked me about jicama, which is another interesting word to pronounce. I actually don't know very much about jicama except for the fact that it's delicious. Um, so jicama is a tuber vegetable with like kind of a brown sort of hairy skin on it. The inside is very, very white um, and very, very crisp. Uh, and delicious. Um, I like it in salads. It's very good with tropical fruits and citrus fruit, um, but you can have it savory as well. There's a steakhouse down the street from my house that puts uh, jicama in their house salad, which I always get with ranch dressing, and that's delicious. <laughs> um, so yeah. Oh, A says, let's not forget candy corn. I have to tell you, I loved candy corn when I was a kid. Um, it's a little too sweet for me nowadays. But fun fact about candy corn, candy corn was originally called chicken feed, which is kind of 
mind on and somebody blew my mind on the internet the other day they showed me a picture someone had stacked candy corn in like a circle going up so it made a cylinder it looked just like a cob of field corn which of course you know you think about the candy corn looks like individual kernels of corn but man i was surprised at how much it looked like a cob of corn when it was stacked up like that whoa neil has shared a brown celery sauce recipe what that's like mind-blowing yeah so i'm just gonna reveal anna catherine i did find a celery sauce recipe that's like a pickle with tomatoes in it that called for six heads of celery this recipe so clearly more than one kind of celery sauce who would have thunk people love celery romans loved celery i don't know if we knew that but uh celery is very old food um of course way back in the day it was way more bitter than it is now so it was used mostly as an herb not as like a vegetable but yeah interesting okay so neil's brown celery sauce recipe has celery make pepper and salt um butter rolled in flour right that's to thicken it up a little bit a glass of red wine a spoonful of ketchup half a pint of good gravy garnished with lemon yeah which ketchup is she talking about that's a whole nother that's a whole nother uh rabbit hole we could go down right because of course historically ketchup was more like asian fish sauce usually with walnuts or mushrooms so who knows all these sauces maybe next week we can talk about sauces um because americans don't really use sauces that much anymore i mean we have our favorite prepared sauces all of our salad dressings mayonnaise barbecue sauce ketchup the various mustards um but there are a lot of french inspired sauces and also a lot of really interesting pickles um that just do not make it to the table anymore so yes we can we can talk about ketchup right now if you want marty um so historically ketchup was not made of tomatoes um tomato ketchup does predate heinz that's uh the food that built america fudged that a little bit um but he is the person who popularizes it right and commercializes it um but originally ketchup was more like a fermented sauce a brown sauce um made out of either mushrooms and or walnuts and there was supposed to be like savory meaty thing i also read an a article about the death of a1 steak sauce like armenials killing steak sauce so <laughs> i'll share the wheel like, we're definitely going to talk about sauces next week now because it seems like everybody is interested yes anna Catherine, it seems like everyone had a cauliflower pickle because of course why would you eat cauliflower when you could have potatoes in the 19th century everybody preferred potatoes to cauliflower but pickled cauliflower is not bad um if you've ever heard of chow chow right that's or piccalilli those are old-fashioned mixed vegetable pickles that usually include cauliflower okay is this the same celery sauce recipe neil no a different celery sauce without the wine interesting um yeah so we can definitely talk about sauces next week i'll do my research i still have had my drink you guys still so good what we should do a zoom where we all make the same vintage drink and then have a taste test yes mustard pickle oh we can talk about mangoes not the fruit the pickled kind of mangoes right which i'm pretty sure were made either from melon or from bell peppers in the united states because of course we didn't have actual mangoes in the united states until quite late mustard pickle which often has um turmeric in it to make it very yellow I think that's why so like there's a stereotype that american 19th century food is very bland um and it was kind of 
But I, I think we're eating a lot more of all these interesting pickle recipes than we think. Because they're in, they're in every cookbook from the 19th century. There's like a whole section of pickle recipes in the back. And they're all fascinating pickle recipes. It's not all, you know, cucumber pickles, which is what we normally think of when we think of pickles. And also, why are cucumbers pickles and everything else is pickled vegetables? Like, why isn't it pickled cucumbers? I don't know. I'll look it up. <laughs> Uh-oh. Heather is not a fan of pickled food. I have to say, I I like most, I'm not the kind of person who can just eat a, a pickled cucumber. I can't do it. I just can't. But I love pickles on things or with stuff. Like I'll eat a pickle with the sandwich, but I can't just take, I can't just eat a jar of pickles like some people. Um, so my other new uh, thing that I have learned since coming to New York is how much I love half sour pickles, fermented half sour pickles, which are pickles that are not quite fully fermented. They still kind of taste like cucumbers. They're delicious. Oh, Andy Poe says mustard pickles are huge in Newfoundland. Like, no joke, a couple of years ago, one company on the island was going to stop making them, and then all of the Newfoundlers rallied in protest online. And now you can still buy mustard pickles in Newfoundland. Well, you'll have to try it next time you're in Newfoundland, Andy, and let us know. Oh, Neil, I don't know what part of the Midwest you're talking about, because it's not my part, but some people in the Midwest still call green peppers mangoes. It's funny how that stuff hangs on. Right? Oh, pickled herring. Oh, pickled herring. So despite being um, Swedish and Norwegian and Danish, I have never actually had pickled herring. I'm always too afraid to try it. I've also never had lutefisk, which is another thing we can go into. There are innumerable kinds of pickled herring. Um, regular pickled herring and cream pickled herring being the two most common. Um, Someday, someday I'll get up the gun to try it, but that's very Scandinavian pickled herring. Yeah. And I believe Anna Catherine mentioned a while back. Uh, let's see in the comments here. Yes, if you don't have a fridge, you have to keep the vegetables safe somehow. And yes, definitely a lot of pickled vegetables are low acid vegetables, which are not safe to water bath can. So obviously prior to canning, home canning, um, pickling and sugaring the heck out of things, you know, putting them in syrup or making preserves uh, was the best way to keep things safe to eat, um, for a long time before refrigeration. Once we get canning though, most water bath canning is only safe with acid foods. Um, although people did water bath can low acid foods like vegetables, you know, green beans, corn, stuff like that. But they were literally boiling them for hours. Like you'd boil your corn for six hours and you'd have to keep it at a rolling boil. And even then that's not going to kill the botulism. Um, so pickling with vinegar and salt or fermenting um, with salt, making a salt brine and fermenting it, that is the easiest way uh, to keep foods safe. All right, everybody is telling me I have to eat pickled herring. So maybe next time I make a grocery run, I'll be brave and I'll pick up some pickled herring and some Vasa crisp bread. Because if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it right. Right? You have to have it with Vasa. Um, all right. Wow. That was like a whirlwind of topics, you guys. I'm so happy we have a topic for next time. I am definitely going to look up sauces. Anna Catherine, I might knuckle down and contact the Hines History Center and see if they have any insights into... Um, celery sauce, uh, what the Heinz version was. Uh, and when I find out, I'll do a little blog post. Does anybody have any last questions while I finish my delicious desert healer cocktail? Yes, we are. So there's comments now about Lutefisk. Lutefisk, for those of you who don't, who don't know, is um, air dried codfish. Um, I believe it's also slightly salted. It might just be sea salt from the sea air. But it's air-dried uh, codfish that you reconstitute in lye. There's our favorite friend, lye. You soak it in lye and then rinse it a bunch of times. 
Um, it's supposed to smell disgusting, uh, and it does smell not very good. But when you reconstitute it in lye, what it does is it it um, puffs the dried fish up again and gives it a texture similar to fresh fish. Uh, not so much the taste. Don't think it really tastes like much of anything, um, which is why most people douse it in butter, right, in the Midwest. But it's very much a poverty food. Um, interesting thing, Basque fishermen, right, from Spain, uh, were fishing the Atlantic cod banks before Columbus made it to North America. They didn't go ashore and they didn't tell anybody about it because they didn't want anybody to steal their fishing grounds. But the Atlantic cod banks um, and cod in medieval Europe was basically the food of Lent, right? Lenten food. Um, so like if you've ever heard of bacalao in Spain or Portugal, uh, that's codfish. And then of course, a lot of the Northern countries is particularly in Scandinavia, uh, use a lot of cod, also codfish balls, um, which are like meatballs, but made out of codfish and served in like a cream sauce. It's very Norwegian. Um, so yeah, codfish, Socks are threatened now, so I try not to eat too much of it. Um, catfish is actually a fairly decent, more sustainable analog for codfish. I prefer it to tilapia. I'm not a tilapia fan. Tilapia, also known as dolphin fish, so if you ever see a historic recipe that calls for dolphin, they're probably not talking about um, everybody's favorite maritime mammal. They're talking about tilapia. <laughs> Oh, Becca is requesting a cooking show. <laughs> that is difficult to do live, Becca, for a variety of reasons, one of which is that my kitchen is poorly lit and not very um, photogenic. Um, but I did talk about maybe I would make some salads, some non-cooked food live on there. So maybe I'll do that in the future if people are getting sick of cocktails. Or I could do cocktail and a snack, maybe. Okay, Chad recommends creamy pickled herring with lingonberry sauce. That could be good. Um, Anna Catherine recommends pickled herring with an ice cold martini. I do not have any vermouth in the house. I don't know how to make a real um, martini. Yes, dolphin fish slapia. I mean, double check me, but yeah, I'm pretty sure. So if you see recipes for dolphin, it's not. It's a fish. It's a fish. Oh, Heather says, what are you going to drink that would tie into sauces? I don't know. I often don't decide on my cocktail until the last minute. I did a couple of weeks ago go through a number of cookbook, um, cocktail books, I should say cocktail recipe books, and um, pick out a bunch that went with the stuff I have on hand and also sounded like something I would drink. <laughs> but uh, we'll see if I can find pickled herring on my next grocery run. Uh, my next grocery run can't be till next Wednesday, so... We'll find out. I don't know. Maybe I should drink. I don't have any awk of it. That would be the real traditional drink to go with pickled herring. Um, I'll think about that, Heather. What would be good to go with a discussion of sauces? Although there are an infinite number of sauces. Um, I can definitely give everybody my recipe for the best ever macaroni and cheese because that's also a sauce, right? And we could talk about the history of macaroni and cheese next time. We talked about it a little bit last time, but I want to delve more into the 18th century history. Bloody Marys contain all the sauces. I I don't know if I can do a Bloody Mary. I'm already. For one, I don't have any tomato juice. And for two, I hate tomato juice. <laughs> so we'll see. I'll, I'll dig around and see what I can come up with. Um... On my list is to find a cocktail that involves flame. I'm not going to pour it flaming from one glass to another, like that 1860s reference I posted on Facebook. Um, but a flaming cocktail interests me. So I'm going to see if I can find anything good. What? Marty. Mac and cheese and ketchup do not go together. No. <laughs> We're not doing that. 
When I said mac and cheese, the mac and cheese is the kind that I make has a white sauce, a bechamel sauce. Technically, it's a more sauce because it has cheese in it. Bloody Marys are, for some reason, a, a breakfast drink. I don't know. I'll have to look up the history of Bloody Marys now. I don't really know very much about them. Um, I don't know how they or... Uh, what's the word? The champagne one. Mimosas became the brunch drink of choice. Although, interestingly, um, the mint julep and a bunch of fizzes, like, like gin fizz and stuff, apparently those were all supposed to be breakfast drinks. Morning drinks. Who knew? Aha, uh -huh, Neil says flaming punch. Yeah, I'm not gonna make a whole punch bowl though because I can't drink that by myself. I'll have to find an individual serving version. <laughs> but yes, there is a German flaming punch. I think you strain it through a little strainer with, with sugar cubes on top too, right? Heather says, what about porky mac? I assume that's macaroni and cheese with pulled pork on top. That is very good. But I'm a little bit of a mac and cheese purist. I like mine very creamy, not baked, because who has the time for that? And also it gets too dry. Um, so I like mine very creamy stovetop mac uh, with lots of salt and black pepper. That's how I like my mac and cheese. And I can eat like three bowls of it that way, which is why I don't make it that often. But every once in a while, you need some comfort food in a hurry. And macaroni and cheese is your friend when it comes to that. <laughs> Marty says anything can be a breakfast drink if you're adventurous. This would actually make a very good brunch drink, by the way. Um, although you probably wouldn't want to drink it with anything very heavy. It might be good with eggs. Yes, Neil says Flaming Punch needs a sugar loaf. I don't have that in the house either. I don't even have sugar cubes. I should add that to my list too. Because lots of cocktails call for like a whole sugar cube, which I don't have. Okay, people. Last call. Last call for questions. I feel like I'm kind of chugging this down. I'm starting to feel it a little bit. I know I'm a total lightweight. I'm going to save a little for Chad. I want him to try it. He'll probably hate it because it's sweet, but it's gin, so you never know. <laughs> oh, Neil can give me sugar loaf. Of course you have sugar loaf, Neil, but I'll have to do some kind of exchange down to Warwick. Yep. Maybe I can make crackers. Hmm. To go with pickled herring. Am I that ambitious? I'm not sure. We'll find out. Okay, folks. Uh, I think it's time to go. We've been chitty chatting for an hour. Um, so for those of you who missed it, tonight's cocktail was the Desert Healer containing cherry brandy, gin, orange juice, and ginger ale. So I will put the recipe up on the blog post when I post this video on thefoodhistorian.com. Um, I will also eventually get around to um, cropping up just the cocktail sections of the rest of these videos and putting them up on my YouTube channel, also under The Food Historian. Um, and if you're not on my email list, uh, you should join. <laughs> you can do it right on the website um, or on the Facebook page. And I will be sending you all kinds of cool stuff. For instance, today I sent out um, a reminder about tonight. Uh, links for how to sign up to my upcoming talks. And all the cool food historians that I follow on Instagram. Uh, and if you want to follow me on Instagram, I'm at preserve or perish. Dot, sorry, at preserve or perish. Because it's just Instagram. All right, so Sarah Walker Johnson, I'm the Food Historian, signing off. Thanks, everyone, so much for joining tonight and asking such great questions. Next week, I don't know what the cocktail will be, but we will talk about sauces and macaroni and cheese. All right, have a good night. Bye. Bye.